Hi folks, it's Dave Brown again. We're looking at case study two and the major essay. Now, um, I'm going to read it through for you and give you commentary as I read it. Okay, so um, it's in the um, law and risk management side. So far we've had uh, a look at the Workplace Health and Safety Act, so we know a little bit of what's in it. To understand it in detail would require a year-long course in a uh, law faculty in the third or fourth year. So we, uh, what we have is good given the time. These next two, so, so what I'm saying there really is, look, you know, um, the standard is, is obviously high enough for this course, but you don't want to go through this whole um, kind of process that would be, that a lawyer would go through in order to understand the implications of this. But so, so there'll be, you'd be able to make an argument, but um, you might not be able to make the argument a lawyer would in a court situation where you've not only got to use or refer to the, um, um, the, the act itself, but you've got to refer to case law, which defines the terminology of the act and also another act called the Acts Interpretation Act which um, interprets, which is an act that tells you how to interpret acts which is pretty crazy. Uh, okay, so next, next paragraph. Uh, these next two assignments are designed to give you a taste of what you need to do in a workplace. It's very simple to use the Workplace Health and Safety Act to ensure that the workplace complies with obvious risks that the acts and regulations specifically mention. But, where a new risk enter, rears its head, there is a whole new set of skills that are needed. These skills of research and argument can be used in every risk management situation, but each workplace presents its own set of problems and has its own culture. Often the culture disregards some hazards. Argument and research is necessary here too. So. Now I want you to uh, think a little bit about this, so what I'm saying there is um, uh, first of all the, the, the assessments are combined in a sense, that you still have to do two separate pieces of assessment work, um, but um, the uh, assessment case study two uh, looks more at what argument you're going to use and, and the major essay is how you're going to use that argument, so the major essay builds on that, demonstrating the way that you would put an argument together, both um, you might want to do it graphically as well as with um, some talk if you want, or just written, uh, you can do it pretty much in any way you like, but the most important thing is to demonstrate that you can get the concepts and ideas across to people who are not uh, occult and safety people. Okay, so uh, we will make case study one and the major essay related to each other. This gives you a better flow from a simple to a more complex task and allows you to develop your skills incrementally. In other words, it should be more fun than just doing two unrelated assignments. And more relevant too because that's generally how you, you get it in the sort of safety area is um, something will be, will be pointed out to you um, and um, once that's uh, uh, once once you're aware of the fact that there's a risk involved somewhere you then got to make an assessment what the hazard is what the risk is and then then often that's not enough right because you've got to be able to demonstrate to people who are going to make or back your decision They've got to demonstrate. You've got to be able to demonstrate that um, that what you're doing is is the right thing under the Act, and just the right thing in terms of decreasing the chance or likelihood of a person being um, um, injured or or getting sick or whatever. So uh, let's have a look. Um, we start with case study two being a re being a research project for the major essay. I'll explain that in a minute. So case study two is to be your basic notes and research for your major essay. All I want to see is a basic list and point form working out 
which you will use to get prepared for the major essay. There are no formal sets of requirements for case study two. It can be basic, but it needs to help you conceptualise the argument and data uh, that you will use in the major essay. I can then read this and help you think about it all before you actually start the major essay. So the major essay is the, you know, it's worth 50%. Case study is only 25%, which is roughly a thousand words. Um, I'm not putting a, a sort of a word limit on it because it's kind of silly if you're using pictures and diagrams and circles and arrows and, and ideas and so forth, well then you can't, you know, how do you judge those as what, what they are word wise? Bad man, so I have a drink. Um, my parents are in the background by the way, so um, there may be the occasional noise. Okay, now we're familiar with the um, with, uh, normal workplace health and safety um, hazards. We understand how they work. Um, you know, there's chemical hazards, there's breathing hazards, there's, um, you know, slip and fall injuries, there's people getting run over. I mean, you, you can just go through hundreds and hundreds of them, you'll find plenty of them there. So, um, but but when when you stretch your mind a bit sometimes with with something like this this is a sort of a stretchy case if you like because the idea behind it is to post something which at the present time actually hasn't uh, uh, isn't taken very seriously I think when we look back on it in uh, ten years time and we've built up some case law on it this this will be one of the most one of the major um, risks that are involved. Now, I'll tell you why I got into it in the first place. Um, I was fascinated by um, viruses. That they, I, I have no science background whatsoever. So, apart from I think uh, maybe grade eight or nine or something, I might have done something in science then, but I can't. Honestly, I, I'm like so unscientific. So, um, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, there's a new thing. Um, or which has been around for a little while called iTunes U. It's worth looking that up. So that's I T U N uh, T U N E S, and then a, a, a U after it, just the, the letter U, as in uniform. Now um, this is accessible by downloading iTunes, which is free, and you can use it on a PC or a Mac. It's no problem. Uh, you know or anything basically I think it works on um, and if you have a look on the internet and just see it'll tell you how to there'll be places that show you how to get to it but essentially what it is is it's a collection of lectures and courses given by universities around the world and, and I'm not talking um, you know sort of strange flimsy universities I'm talking you know Yale, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge you know the, the major um, some of the major universities, really big ones, you know, some who specialise in particular areas, Monash, um, is on it. So I'm not sure if UniSA has got anybody who's put their lectures up there, but it's, um, it's fantastic and you can study anything and it's completely free. Now, you don't get assessed in it, obviously, but you get all the information, if the whole of the course except for the assessments. So they'll show you the readings, so they're all accessible there, you can get to the readings, you can get to um, you watch the watch or listen to lectures, depending on what they do, a lot of them are, are video lectures. And I've taken advantage of this quite a lot. I, I, I was fascinated by the American Revolution, and uh, so I um, did um, American Revolutionary History at Yale. I think it was Yale. Was, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Yale. And, um, and that was just amazing amount of fun. It was very interesting. But um, I also did, uh, I think it, it's Harvard, the, the history of viruses. And that really um, made it very, very interesting to look at things like, um, or the history of disease really it was, it was both viruses and bacterial infections. And um, a lot of people are unaware of how incredibly dangerous these, these things can be. Now I'll give you an example. Um, 
the First World War, which went from 1914 to 1918 in Europe for four years, um, the First World War, so the First World War, sorry, I keep stopping from time to time, so it sounds a little bit, um, uh, you know, I sound like I'm repeating myself, that's what's happening. Um, yeah, the First World War um, killed millions of people. But what's interesting is that in 1918, when they were coming back from the from Europe and the, the theatre of war there, um, there was a thing uh, that struck called the Spanish flu. Now, it was only called the Spanish flu because Spain was the only country that actually was honest about the flu epidemic that was going on. And so people called it the Spanish flu because nobody, no other government admitted that the flu was, was so severe. Um, it was actually a European flu, it was all over Europe. That European flu, now I hope you're sitting down when I tell you this, that European flu um, killed in one year 55 million people in Europe. 55 million people. Now there has never been before, I don't think, and there never been since, at least, a virus who is, which has killed so many more people. Now this, bear in mind, these are the days, we're talking 14 to 18, most of the, um, and it's sort of apt at the moment with, um, you know, Anzac Day and the rest, so first, first World War event, um, never before had, uh, you know, well, sorry, people were travelling around by walking or by horse and by essentially that was it there was a little bit of mechanics going on but not a lot you know um, it wasn't sort of like gigantic tank warfare and and flying aircraft and jets and bombs and being dropped and all of that shit it was very very sort of um, hands, hands on face to face over trenches kind of warfare um, and so you know people caught things from from each other they didn't really understand the nature of viruses or bacteria at that time that that hadn't uh, the the enormous um, changes that have occurred <laughs> my bird went oh. uh, the, the enormous changes that have occurred um, over time now uh, were, were certainly not in existence then you know didn't have um, didn't have the ability to give a person with a bacterial infection an antibiotic, for instance. Um, so people, you know, but 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 on the other hand, um, they were fairly easily controlled because they, in order to go somewhere, they would go by boat. Oh, sorry, that was the other one. So so there were three forms of transport. There was walking, there was horses, and there were boats. And um, and the boats you know, sort of transported the horses to the, to the field and on it goes from there. So the, um, uh, the spread was actually pretty minimal given what it would be today. So if you got a, um, a, uh, a flu like the H1N1 virus, which is uh, one of the big viruses going around at the moment, uh, if you got a spread like that, it'll really spread in incredibly fast time um, over the world, particularly if you get one like the common flu, which you can um, which you can pick up from somebody coughing or breathing. At the moment, flus flus uh, all viruses mutate. That's the way they generate themselves. So constant in constant mutation. Why it's so difficult to get rid of a cold um, because the mutations of colds change every single year. So you can't really um, deal with uh, these things very easily. They got caught out this year, for instance, when they were um, doing the flu jabs in Europe, that they uh, only, the, the flu jab only managed to cover, I think it was uh, one out of four variants of the flu. So a lot of people who'd, who'd got jabs still weren't um, protected from, by, the, um, by the flu vaccine. Anyway, so put that into the context of a, a workplace, and this is where I'm interested because normally what happens is a worker goes to work, the worker gets injured or sick, and then you apply the act to, you know, did, the, did they um, look to see if there was a, 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 you know, do proper risk assessment to see 
to identify the hazard and then to um, to decrease the risk of that hazard occurring as much as is practically possible you know that kind of thing that goes on that's pretty straightforward sort of stuff it's it's not many mistakes can be made in there what happens so when a worker goes to work makes another person sick through something inadvertent you know in other words giving a you know there's a, a flu there um, for instance they give the person the flu um, and they go home make somebody else very sick and they get very you know um, it's it's kind of it's what's called a sort of vicarious uh, situation almost a vicarious liability um, now I'll give you an example my wife works and uh, I work but I work from home now because I'm on this cancer treatment uh, while I'm on it I've got um, virtually no immune system at all so that means anything that she gets and she comes home with and she passes on to me which is mostly going to be viral um, although it could be bacterial but let's let's just work on viral and in a case of say flu epidemic or whatever she goes to work somebody else has already gone to work and uh, and has um, as an infected person and infected her now she comes home she gets the flu she's not that bad off you know it's not too bad for her she's young and, and fit and healthy um, reasonably so although she's been through cancer herself in the last 12 months so uh, that seems to have been fixed up um, yeah so um, that person who comes to work ends up sorry about that um, ends up passing that on to her she takes it home to me, I end up in intensive care, which is exactly what would happen, and I, um, you know, it takes, you know, five months of my life out or it kills me, uh, which is quite possible as well. In fact, the last time I, I got, um, I went into hospital, my immune system was so low that I caught what they call hospital-acquired pneumonia, and for three days I nearly died. It was uh, quite quite close uh, quite a close call I was circling the plug hole as they call it um, but luckily I ended up in the hospital in intensive care for 11 days um, and that was not a pleasant experience I've got to tell you although I don't remember a great deal of it um, so so this is really what this case study and the major essay is about okay let's go back to reading this um, so uh, we'll start with case study two being a research project for the major SA, yep. Um, and I'll go back to what it says case study two is to be your basic notes and research. Come through that already. Um, all I want to see is a basic list and point form working out. Now, I know you look, this is this has worried people in the past doing this um, because they appear, um, you know, it's not very structured. Um, the case study too but the trouble is um, you know it's only worth 25% so, it's, so it can't be that big thing to do um, we're, we're told you know we've got to be very careful in fact there's a requirement by the university that only certain um, uh, every, every assessment can't be larger than or, or require more effort than a certain amount So we've got to be careful about how we do that. Um, sorry, that was my parrot. My parrot has taken over. A, a, my dogs have a a, um, a squeezy toy that goes wheel wheel whenever you squeeze it, and the parrot thinks it's it's a good noise to make. So occasionally you hear this what it sounds like a dog standing on a squeaky toy, but actually it's the parrot taking the piss because um, the dogs all look up and go what. What was that? Sorry, okay, back to reality. Um, and the other thing is too, with the case study too, it's very important that you, you build into assessment the ability to give good feedback and that that feedback then helps you with um, um, your assessment, uh, uh, your final assessment, so you can, you can progress. So you'll get feedback soon from me on assignment one and that'll help you do the case study two, and then you, you then you'll be left up to your own to do the major essay, which will be the finished product 
that you will give to a um, you know a, a whatever to, to you know a, a, a bunch of people in the organization uh, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute who, who it is you're aiming at that. but it's very I think it's really really important right that you do this that you um, that you learn how to do a preparation and a presentation because you may have all the knowledge you need for about occult and safety but unless that knowledge gets across to the people who make the decisions at the top of the organisation um, then there's it's kind of pointless isn't it you know there's no point in it stopping with you it's got to it's got to go further up the chain of command so that the people at the very you know at the, the top of the organisation who can make broad sweeping changes in terms of practices um, and that might be everyone from the top right the way down to the bottom uh, who need to adhere to these practices they have to they need to understand them they need it to be logical Need it to be something which they can look at and say, "Oh, yeah, that makes sense to me." Uh, all too often, with um, occult health and safety stuff, you find people say, "Oh, you know, those geez, it's a load of bullshit." You know, um, you know, I can't do this. You know, I can't do that. I'm not allowed to do this. Um, there are two general reasons for this: for this hatred of, of work health and safety, which is common. Um, one is that the, the people don't understand the reason for. It. Okay, and two is because it actually is bullshit. Um, it is actually silly. And I'll give you an example of a really, really silly application. In an old people's home, my mother, um, God rest her soul, who died uh, about uh, eight years ago this week, I think. Um, we had to. She wanted to go into an old people's home. I didn't want to put in it, but anyway, she ended up in this bloody old people's home. Uh, and it was all, you know, very clean and nice and nothing wrong with the blah, blah, blah. But I was, um, mum was a, a um, Oxford graduate and she, she, you know, she was 93, but she had a very, very bright mind. So she wanted to listen to the ABC all the time and listen to what was going on in politics and, and all the different things that were going on. She was very happy when she was doing that. And um, she, uh, um, so we, I bought her a radio, right? Uh, and I bought her a radio and I thought, look, what I'll do is I'll buy one that's battery operated because um, then, you know, she doesn't have to worry about having it plugged in or any of that sort of stuff. So um, bought this battery operated radio um, and it happened to have uh, the ability as well to run it from the power if you wanted to, but you didn't have to. And most of them are like that these days. They're not going to, you know, give you a radio that only works on batteries generally speaking. Anyway, so I took it in there and tuned it, you know, I said to them that um, it, she's, she wasn't very good with technical stuff, so I made it so that she could see what, what uh, stations she wanted to switch between and, you know, put marks on it and, and gave her a little card with how to, how to operate it, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I come back the following day and the bloody thing's not there. So I go and see one of the, the workers there and said, um, what's the story? And they said, oh, we've got to have it checked out electronically to see if it's electrically safe. And I thought, I thought, okay, so you're telling me there's a hazard that a battery-operated radio could be a hazard to someone. Well, that is, I don't know how that could ever happen. I, I just, it's beyond my comprehension. I hadn't left the, the wire there. I deliberately didn't, didn't have it plug in because it's cheaper to easier to, to piss about with batteries I had a must admit I had a sinking feeling when I thought oh god they're gonna do something about this anyway so they in the end um, it, it took two days and they got the electrician to look at it and say yes it's safe I, uh, okay I can cope with that you know maybe maybe I can cope with that um, see if it was electrically tested even though it wasn't ever supposed to be or would could not be used in a plug-in mode because I had the bloody um, the plug um, and then I said so they put it back again she got the thing and then I said can you help her tune your radio and they said oh no that's a hazard as well I just could not believe it like no no we, we, we don't do that that's a you know that's a workplace hazard and um, you know you have to come in and tune it for her every day what you know 
it is no wonder the work work health and safety gets a really bad um, name and it's as a result of really stupid decisions like that and of course me being me I couldn't afford couldn't couldn't avoid telling them this is really stupid and oh god did I get into trouble you know so um, anyway that's the way it goes so okay where are we now um, here's the um, here's the factual situation so let me talk this through for you factual situation is is the same for both uh, case study 2 and the major essay you you are a member of staff working at the company's as the company's workplace health and safety advisor it's uh, starting to move into winter which it is the flu season is on us and to add to the worry there's been an outbreak of H1N1 avian uh, avian influenza in mainland China and you've read about this and in fact this did actually happen so <laughs> you work for a company who who, uh, who chooses who chooses and posts out internet orders for a number of companies as a subcontractor? That's that's who you work for. So they, um, uh, it's a little bit like eBay or something like that, or, or Amazon, more like Amazon. You know, they pick orders out from from things and send them out to companies. They work as a subcontractor for a number of companies that sell stuff over the internet. Now you've got a hundred employees who are in close contact with each other at some time of each day and there are also people who come to your workplace as delivery drivers, visitors and even volunteers. Now these words are there for a reason, okay? Don't forget so that you've got people who come on who are not part of your workforce. Do you have an obligation to them? Delivery drivers, visitors and even volunteers. There are machine operators, especially forklift drivers, so there's also working at heights. There's even a guillotine, a device used to cut paper to a particular size. And this is not the sort of guillotine that you've probably all used yourself with one hand, although that could be, that's still a bloody hazard as well. This is a big guillotine, serious one that you have to use both hands to um, stretched out in order to make it to work, so you can't get your fingers in it. You have observed that in the last week, five employees in the work workhouse have asked for five days sick leave each as a result of flu-like symptoms. One of them has just returned from a holiday in China. The works manager is highly critical of people taking sick leave. Um, now, I want to just think about this for a little bit. Um, in think. Ask the question, and in fact, tell me in the in the case study too, if you like, what is the policy in your organisation for taking sick leave? Um, because that policy itself is really important. I'm giving you a big bloody hint here, right? So that if you've got a policy that says a person must have a, um, um, you know, a sick leave certificate from a doctor after to, to take only one day or even two days of sick leave. What's the consequence of that? How does that work? What actually happens? Do people just go to work sick as a result of it because there's no way they can get into a doctor within one day or two days? Or, um, or what the hell do they do? How can they go to a doctor when they're feeling better and say, listen, I had flu, but um, I'm okay now, and get the doctor to say, yes, he had flu. You can't do that. You see what I mean? Um, so, okay, so one, um, one of them has just returned from holiday in Hong Kong. The works manager is highly critical of people taking sick leave. He thinks that you must come to work unless you are so sick you need to be in a hospital. He's not the only authority for this company. Um, there is a board of directors who have ultimate control and you may need to provide them with an argument to develop a policy regarding what's called, and here's the first time you've seen the word, presenteeism, okay? Now presenteeism is like absenteeism, it's the antithesis of it, it's the opposite of it. Um, presenteeism is when you go to work sick, absenteeism is when you don't go to work sick. Um, 
this is not going to be an easy sell to managers. So you'll need to appeal to their requirements under the Act and regulations and to financial considerations also. There is no word in this, by the way, that is not significant, okay? There is significance in every word. Um, okay, so imagine that you must make an argument to management about the introduction of measurements, measures to deal with presenteeism. To do so, you will need to argue using some, using some data, if you can find it, and general sections of the uh, Workplace Health and Safety Act, any jurisdiction you like, if you want, and a good logical argument. Now, the good logical argument's what I'm looking for the most. In, assi in, in assignment two, I want to see how the logic of that argument is going to be put forward. You don't have to do the argument, but you have to demonstrate the sort of points that you want to make, the sort of points you need to research in order to put forward an argument, uh, whichever way you go, but as to what the Work Health and Safety Act is going to require. So you first of all need to know what the Health and Safety Act requires, and then you've got to go further to that as to how that's going to feed into your argument. There is very little, if any, case law on the subject, so there's no right or wrong answer yet, but there will be. Um, there is no trick to this assessment with hidden articles or cases to find. Your success will be dependent on your, on your research and argument. Sometimes just a good argument built on common sense is the best you can do with a new area. Okay? Uh, so in this study I want you to, ve to develop, so it says case study 2, about two pages worth 25% of the semester marks. In this study I want you to um, develop a two-page sketch of what you will need to do for the major essay. You need to find three journal articles as a minimum and summarise them, include a definition of presenteeism in simple words. Remember this is uh, for the managers, so don't make it too complex. <laughs> and uh, well, see, if you're doing it for board members, these people are not going to be um, um, giants of, in the in the safety area. Probably, you know, they probably do other stuff, but they they're not. You need you need to take them through. It. Take you need to take everybody by the hand and walk them through um, requirements like this. Um, and a draft of what you think the major essay should include. So that's that's it really, okay? Um, you can read the major essay bit yourself, um, and I'll do another podcast on the major essay. It's, it's probably... Um, um, that's probably the best way of going. I've got uh, mistakes I made down here just after the major essay. Uh, whenever a lecturer develops a new assignment, we, we um, always make mistakes. Please email me if you haven't, uh, if I haven't been clear, or so, so I can correct them. Together we will come up with some great work on this, I'm sure. I'm a little like the, the coaches on The Voice, <laughs> nothing like the judges on American Idol. So if, if you, these are two of my fav favourite programs, I've got to say, isn't that pathetic of me? Uh, my success is achieved through your success. I'm not here to judge you, I'm here to coach you to be the best you can for this assignment. So there's a, now you go down a little bit and I've got a picture of the, of what the picture of the factory floor, so you've got a physical understanding of what's going on. Here's somebody working on a forklift. Does that look a little bit sus? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's right, this is probably not the way to use forklifts in a safe manner. I've got to love that. Um, so anyway, look, you've got all of that there, it gives you some sort of uh, bit of reference. This is, um, I notice I've still got it as 2014 semester one, it should be changed to 2015 semester one, so sorry about that. But anyway, there you are, I'm going to leave you to it. Um, and. Uh, if you have any problems at all, please give me a, um, uh, a ring or, or an email and we'll take it from there.